look at this. This is perhaps the biggest snake the world has ever seen. Colonel Remy Van Lierde was a respectable RAF squadron leader, and one day he was returning from a mission in the Katanga area of the Congo jungle when he saw this in his helicopter. Colonel Remy describes the snake as being 50 feet in length. That's 15 meters, making it the largest snake ever discovered by a human. What makes this story particularly convincing is not only the fact that Van Lierd was a reliable eyewitness, a second world war hero, but also because zoologists and the CIA themselves looked at the colonel's photographs and declared that they were genuine. They were not fakes. You won't believe me when I tell you this, but there is an even more dangerous snake than the one photographed by the colonel. And before I introduce you to him, first let me show you the largest snake that we know about today. Medusa is a 25 foot reticulated python who is known to be able to eat an 80 pound deer for breakfast. After doing a little digging, it's hard to know where Medusa is residing today. The last we know of, she was reported to be living at the haunted house attraction called the Edge of Hell Company. But one thing we do know, if Medusa is still alive, the last she was recorded in 2011 by the Guinness World Records, she measured 25 feet. But if today she's still living, one thing we can be sure of she will be significantly larger. So, have you guessed what the most dangerous snake in the world is yet? Well, I think many people will think it's the Titan Naboa, but I'll tell you, it's not. In case you're not familiar with this mammoth-sized snake, Titanoboa is a 47-foot reptile that became extinct just after the dinosaurs. Over 30 fossils have been found in coal mines near Colombia. But that's not all. In Borneo, there is a snake that is claimed to be 100 feet long. This snake is called the Nabu. And locals have even taken photos of this snake. But when many experts have examined the photos, they claim it is nothing more than the work of an editing software. Okay, the wait is over. What is the snake that every man, every woman must run a million miles from? Well, this snake has famously been called the Serpent of Old. And he's also known as the Great Dragon. One of the reasons this snake catches his prey is because he is so attractive to the eye that he dazzles them with his beauty. Another reason is, and this will sound crazy, is that he can communicate with humans and not only talk to them, but charm and deceive them. Perhaps you're not impressed yet. Well, did you know that this snake's secret weapon is that he's actually an angel? This angel takes on the form of a serpent and as wise, as smart, as strong as you might be as a human being, there's not a man or woman alive who could match the power of an angel. So, what is the name of this snake species? He is called Satan and there is only one. Satan wasn't actually created to look like a snake, but one day he entered into the body of a serpent, one of the creatures that God had made and pronounced as good. And Satan used that serpent as a tool, as a way to cause the woman to fall into sin. Most people don't know that 99% of the depictions of the serpents in the Garden of Eden are wrong. All the paintings, all the films, all the movies show the serpent as completely inaccurate. And before I tell you why, first I need to show you the strategy of Satan and I need to show you how he messes up people's lives and he'll ruin yours if you give him the chance. Just like in the Garden of Eden, Satan will disguise his true character and he will come to you. Eve was not looking for the serpent, but the serpent was looking for Eve. Then the devil will plant seeds of doubt into your mind. What did he say to Eve? Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And he'll use the exact same method on you today. He'll make you doubt the truthfulness of the word of God. He'll make you think that, can I really let God be the authority for my life? Is God withholding some superior pleasure from me because he doesn't want me to be happy? If Satan had a mission statement, it would be, FOMO, the fear of missing out. 
Does God really want you to miss out on all the fun that's on Tinder? Does God really love you? I mean, how can he love you if he doesn't want you to go out and party like everyone else? Is God really that interesting? I mean, don't bother reading the Bible when instead you could watch this on Netflix or you could have this on the internet instead. Guys, I truly do believe that the root of pretty much every single sin is that lie that God is not enough that God is holding back pleasures from us and that the grass is always greener on the other side. As you know, in the story, Eve explains to the serpent, who is obviously playing dumb, that God has said you can eat from all of the trees in the garden except that one. If you eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, you will surely die. The devil then changes gear and says, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, come on, be honest with me right now. If a powerful being stepped before you and said, I can make you like God, would it not make you listen? So really, there's one thing I want to warn you about as we approach, as we enter into this new year. There's one thing I want you to be very wary of. Beware of Mr. Worldly Wise Men. Beware of those people who appear to be angels of light, who make promises to increase you, to help you. But you need to look below the surface. You need to look at the end of their road. Do their teachings lead you into a greater love for God, a greater love for the gospel, into more holiness, into more devotion to the Lord? Or do their teachings lead you into more worldliness, more self-centeredness, the love of money, the love of the pleasures of this life? I'm not saying never listen to non-Christians on the internet. I'm not saying that self-help gurus can never be helpful, but I am saying be very very, very careful this year who you listen to because the devil has his henchmen in all corners of the internet. The Bible says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. You see, the devil exploited Eve's weak spots. He knew that she liked beautiful things, and he also knew that she wanted to be wise like the Lord. And likewise, my dear friends, the devil knows your weak spots. You see, the devil's a little bit like the YouTube algorithm. If you're into gym and fitness videos and you watch one or two of them, suddenly when you go on the YouTube app, in front of you will be lots of gym and fitness videos, and you click on them, because those are the videos you're interested in. And likewise, the devil has been watching you. But he doesn't just have a few data points like Google. He doesn't just have a little bit of search history. No, he watches you all the time and he knows exactly how to get you to click. You see, the devil knows that if he dangles this bit of beautiful bait in front of that woman, she'll bite. He knows that if he discourages this man, if he grinds this man down with this, and then dangles this bait in front of him, he'll fall. And my dear friends, the only way for you and I to beat our enemy, because this enemy has been watching humans for a long, long time, and he's an expert now at making us sin, the only way for us to beat him is to know thyself, is to have self-awareness, to predict 10 moves ahead. So okay, I'm at university, and coming up now is Freshers Week, and I know that is a week where I could very easily be tempted. Okay, tonight I'm alone. I'm in in the house on my own for a long period of time. I need to be very careful now. Okay, that old drinking buddy who I used to go out with, he's phoned me up and says, can we meet up? And I said, yes. I need to be very careful. That co-worker, I'm on a work trip with them. Oh, I could easily fall into sin with them. My dear friends, you must prepare for battle. And the only way we prepare is on our knees because the devil is really crafty. So, once Adam and Eve took the bait, Eden was destroyed, paradise was lost, but the serpent was cursed by God to slither on its belly. It was told that you will eat dust for the rest of your life. And that is why 99% of artists draw the serpent wrong. They draw it as a snake 
wrapped around a tree. But it's clear the serpent most definitely would have had legs. Some people say the serpent would have looked like a crocodile, or maybe an iguana, or maybe even a glistening dragon. But some Bible theologians believe that the serpent may have looked like a delicate kind of creature, an innocent animal. As verse 14 says, you are cursed more than all cattle. As if the serpent was already a type of cattle, and once it disobeyed God, he cursed it instantly and made it into a slithering reptile. Martin Luther said that before sin, the serpent was a most beautiful little animal, and most pleasing to man, as little mules, sheep and puppies are today. I'm going to make a statement now, and you tell me, yes or no, do you agree with this statement? This is certainly a dangerous snake, but this is also certainly a crushed snake. Do you agree with that statement? The Bible says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first ever gospel sermon that was ever preached. Despite the fact that Adam and Eve fell out of their family tree, a champion would rise, and this champion would stand up to the serpent and crush his head. Satan introduced this world to sin. He destroyed God's perfect world and stamped men and women with his own image. He started a fight with man. But God stepped in to finish it. And God instantly repaired the destruction that was caused and promised a remedy straight away. This remedy was the promise. The promise of a saviour. And that saviour did come. His name is Jesus Christ. And just like the prophecy said, the devil indeed did bruise his heel. From the moment Christ was born, from the moment he entered into this world, the devil did everything he could to stop him. He entered into a king called Herod, and when Herod heard that there was another king on the block, he did everything he could to put out the light of the world before he'd even started. The Lord Jesus Christ he warned his disciples. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven because he knew how dangerous the devil was. Jesus Christ faced the devil when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil did everything he could to bruise Christ's heel. But the Lord Jesus Christ came out unwounded. The Lord Jesus Christ, he faced many devils. They were called legion. And those devils trembled when they saw the Lord Jesus. They said, please, please do not send us into the abyss. But let us go into this herd of pigs. So Christ, the champion, cast them into a herd of pigs. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ faced the serpent again in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says in the Bible that the Lord Jesus Christ, his sweat was like drops of blood when I believe the devil was showing him the horrors of what was about to come on the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he had one final fight with the devil on the cross. When the devil used many instruments, he used Herod, Pilate, Caesar, the Jews and the Romans, and they were used like little chess pieces to try and bruise the king. And they did bruise my king. They put a crown of thorns into his skull. They drove nails through his hands and his feet. They smacked him. They mocked him. They bruised him. And the Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? Because on the cross, my sin, your sin, the rottenness that we all carry, the skeletons in our closet, was laid on Christ. And the Lord God poured out all of his wrath, all of his judgment on Jesus Christ, so that we could be forgiven, cleansed, and that our sin would no longer be seen if we come to Christ, the Saviour. And then Christ was laid in a tomb, and the devil, you can imagine him, he hissed, this serpent hissed with joy, thinking it was all over. Deity had been defeated, dead, lying there. But the champion rose again, as if a man rising from a refreshing sleep, the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that is the day when the Lord Jesus Christ finally bruised the serpent's head. It was crushed, defeated. And the Bible promises us that one day the Lord God will come again and he will cleanse this earth 
from the serpent's slippery, slimy trail, and he'll make it brand new. And I need to ask you, are you ready for that day? Have you turned away from the devil? Have you turned away from the worldly wise men? And have you turned to Christ? Have you put your trust in the champion, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins, who rose from the dead, and is willing to give you eternal life and to wash away your sins with his own blood that was shed on that cross? Come to him today. And if you too want to bruise the serpent's head, do you know what? One thing you can do to do that today, preach the gospel. Every time the gospel is preached, every time a soul is saved, the serpent's head is crushed again. And if you want to learn how to do that, I've got a whole bunch of videos right here on how to preach the gospel and share the gospel effectively.